Good afternoon, folks. It's Dave Burroughs, uh, Chief Strategist and President of Barometer Capital. I want to thank you all for joining us today. We've been doing these weekly now since the beginning of the pandemic. I noticed on my chart today that from the market top, it's been about 80 days. When I started doing these, the fireplace behind me was lit because it was cold and it was still the middle of winter. And today, I don't mind being working from the, the Barometer North office in Midtown Toronto. Uh, we've been doing uh, regular morning Zoom calls with all of our teammates. Uh, we've had uh, several portfolio calls, usually two or three a day. Uh, and in fact, I think people are probably communicating better in this format than they are when they're all in the office. Certainly, I don't mind having a little bit of sunshine and, and green leaves out the back. Uh, certainly better than being on the 18th floor of, the, of one university. Um, but uh, the market is the market, and uh, I thought maybe it would be useful to, to have a, a, a re-up this week because, of course, the world continues to change. Uh, we are sort of on the path to reopening, and, uh, and markets have been sort of responding. Um, just to take a quick look, uh, of course, we had the very difficult decline falling into March 23rd. We had an initial technical bounce off the bottom. We were fortunate to get repositioned in portfolios after having been stopped out of many positions on the way down. Market pulled back a little. We had a second lift uh, based on the stimulus, some of the monetary and fiscal stimulus, which has been remarkable. Uh, market chopped around a bit for a few weeks. Uh, and then as the COVID data started to get better and as the economic data started to show some bottoming, uh, we started to see a, a, a next leg. And of course, the market's now sitting about uh, between five and 6% uh, from the highs. Now, the market's not a homogenous place. There's things that have done better and things that have done worse. We like to look underneath the surface to see what's actually been happening. Uh, and if you take a look at our risk indicators, which we publish each week, uh, you can see that our main long-term indicators for Canada, for the NYSE and for stocks globally have all been improving. They're in green, which means that breadth for global markets has been expanding, more and more stocks participating. We are not yet on the long-term models to overbought territory. Uh, they certainly have been getting better. When we look at our short-term indicators, they are getting a little bit overbought. The percent of stocks above the 50-day moving average for each of these major markets is really at the very upper end of the band, uh, which means uh, that you could see a pause at any point. Percent of stocks with positive weekly momentum, which means upward trajectory is quite high and improving. Uh, percent of stocks making new highs versus new lows has been improving. And percent of stocks trading above their long-term moving average has now finally moved above 50%. All of them moved higher over the course of the week. So the drum keeps beating, things keep getting better. I think it's interesting. We think that a lot of the things that have been going on are being driven not so much by professional investors, but there's a lot of a lot of money coming in from the sidelines, people who are stuck at home trading on Robinhood. Uh, retail participation or small investor participation has been very, very high. Uh, you can see it in the call buying data, uh, quite extreme. And you can see it in some of the frothiness of very small stocks, things that people might consider to be affordable, one, two, three dollar stocks. In the past week, many of you may have read some of the stories about companies that have declared bankruptcy uh, going up in the hundreds of percents like Hertz uh, and the Chesapeake Energy because they were affordable and people decided they wanted to buy low price stocks. So it's a little bit frothy and I think we've got to be a little bit careful. Uh, NYSC breadth bottomed at 6%, meaning only 6% of stocks were in uptrends when we hit bottom in March. That was commensurate with the lows in 1998, uh, 2002, three in the tech wreck, uh, the financial crisis lows bottomed at about those same levels. Uh, the uh, European debt crisis, uh, the, uh, the slowdown in China in 2015-16, and then of course uh, what we saw just recently. Um, when we looked at the U.S. market, clearly market continues to be in a secular bull market, working the way, working its way higher. Um, uh, when we look at global breadth, global breadth bottomed at 10 percent, so it's all stocks globally sitting today at 60 percent and rising. So long-term breadth improving globally and of course in the last week global stocks really had a big move uh, as the US dollar weakened a little bit. 
this is the big story. And I think that this is a remarkable chart. I really would encourage people to think about this. The red line is global liquidity being pushed into the system. This, this chart goes back to 1981. And you'll see that there is a remarkable correlation between the amount of liquidity that's being provided to the market and what world financial assets do. And this most recent stimulus push by the Fed has been remarkable. The only thing we can compare it to is what happened around the Plaza Accord in the early 1980s. And of course, we know that fueled the bull market that went on for many, many years. So we can't underestimate, despite the negative economic data, despite the fear around the, the, the pandemic, the impact that all of that cash floating around in the system has on financial assets. The Fed is being very clear. They want people to use cash to buy assets. They'd like to see the price of assets go up because of course they help offset liabilities on the other side. So the leadership over the last week really continued to be dominated by technology. This is a technology ETF XLK. We have groups like cloud-based computing that have been leading since the bottom. Strong relative price strength versus the market. Strong absolute prices higher. Many of the sectors that have led have been the sectors that have benefited from this COVID situations. The work at home stocks, the companies that provide support to a distributed workforce. This is the semiconductor index, which has continued to lead. Cybersecurity has continued to do well. Now you'll notice that in the last week, many of these sort of consolidated over the last seven or eight trading days. Healthcare did the same thing. The miners pulled back a little bit. And we got uh, some rotation into some other groups. Certainly internet commerce remained very, very strong. Amazon's had a wonderful few days uh, after consolidating and the whole group continues to be good. So we talked last week about some of the things that were changing. The biggest thing we mentioned was that the US dollar had started to weaken and that continued this week. When the US dollar is weakening, that's an indication people are willing to take money uh, out of a safe haven asset and put it into something that bears some risk. So it tends to be when the US dollar weakens, global markets do a little better. They certainly did in the last week. Uh, and it tends to be that commodity prices do a little bit better. Uh, and it tends to be that, um, that money finds its way into financial assets. Now, we talked last week about the fact that there's a very high or has been a very high short interest in the S&P. Professional investors really not willing to believe that this rally could be for real. I think that there's lots of questions out there, but I can tell you for sure in the last two weeks, we've had a lot of investors squeezed into the market. People that did not want to put money to work, but have watched the market run away. And the word FOMO comes to mind. Fear of missing out has pulled investors into the market. In many cases, into sectors that have underperformed up to this point. We know that there was a large short position in S&P futures. Similarly, again, some of that being covered over the last week. The groups that were most under-owned or where the flows had been out of over the last three months and last year are the groups that attracted a whole lot of capital in the last two weeks. So this was particularly painful for people who were void of these groups. So international stocks, that's the EFI index, very strong. Money flowed in in the past week into the home builders. Now the consumer in general has been one major beneficiary. And we can see from, from the very short term data that we track, travel, dining, and so on, has started to improve in the US. This is data that we get from Apple Mobility. We know that the traveling data has started to improve and we know that the, the, some, some, some loans are taking place. When we look at financial transactions, this is data on um, on a, a debit card use from the point where the pandemic began, credit card use uh, has, has, has risen sharply. Now, part of that is likely the unwillingness for uh, businesses to take cash, but it also means that there are transactions taking place. So we wanted to, to talk about a couple of names today uh, and um, in the, in the uh, consumer discretionary group, which has remained very, very strong, we have some very good holdings and, and some of these have had remarkable lifts. I've asked James Callahan to join the call today uh, to come on and talk a little bit about a couple of our companies. James, are you there? Well, I don't hear James. 
I don't hear James. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to move on. Um, uh, we have had pretty good exposure to online internet commerce. Uh, we've had very good exposure to some of the providers of the plumbing in that area and then some of the companies that have benefited and certainly a couple of the companies that have been really good at moving their business models toward sort of an online presence one of them being lululemon uh one of them being nike now we like to buy structural long-term themes and clearly the move to the ash the athleisure um uh category has been one that has been significant so lululemon has been a big beneficiary uh as has nike uh, both of them came with very, very strong earnings uh, and, and, and good looks going forward. So consumer discretionary continues to be very strong. In general, high beta or most economically sensitive has had a very, very good two weeks. Now you can see that they pulled back a little over the last couple of days. So I just want to talk a little bit about while our data is positive, what gives us pause? We do think that there are risks out there. The first and most important one is that when we look at corporate earnings versus what the stock market is doing, there's a very clear gap. Now there was a gap back in the 2000 to 2001 to 2002 period where the market continued to do well while earnings did not. And yes, we do believe that we've had an unprecedented stoppage in the economy that should start to come back and that these earnings can come back more quickly than from a regular recession but clearly this is one that we have to watch very closely the second thing that gives us pause is what's happened in the very short run this is a chart that plots the percentage of stocks trading above their 50-day moving average we know that 98 percent of all the stocks in the in the nysc are trading above their 50-day or their short-term moving average now you can look back and you can't see 19, 2018, 2017, 2016, 15, 14. In fact, you can go back to 1990 and you cannot find another time when so many stocks were trading above their short term moving average. It speaks to the fact the market's probably a little bit overbought. We look at three measures that we think are important to watch, none of which have improved. First of all, um, you have the percent of stocks trading above their 50 day moving average, which I pointed out was very, very high. It's a high short-term measure. Second, put call ratio. The number of people buying puts versus the number of people buying calls. Call buying has been very, very high versus put buying. And then third, the percentage of, of companies within the S&P 500 with very high relative strength have had a sharp move higher. And again, this is a historically high number. When you put all three of these together, I can't find another time when all of them are measuring such extreme readings. So clearly this liquidity in the market is having an impact. And clearly there is lots of participation. It doesn't mean it has to stop, but it's something that we're watching closely. We know that the positioning in bonds is very, very high. We know the positioning in stocks started out this process very low relative to history. So, Stock ownership can rise in portfolios and could rise for a long time. But in the very short run, given that we're headed into summer, we're watching our short-term indicators very closely. It also means that we're managing each of our portfolios differently. In the pools that we manage, the equity and long short pool are fully invested and have been very actively focused on those leadership, leadership categories. The balanced and income portfolios, again, very fully invested. Our macro portfolio we've been more cautious with recently, setting up to try and take advantage of a pullback uh, based on the fact that some of this data is so extraordinarily uh, um, uh, speculative in the short run. We think that it's very possible we want to have one of our strategies there to play defense in the effect in the event we get sort of short term pullback. Now, last thing I wanted to talk about is this. We talked last week about the fact that bond prices started to fall over the last few weeks that's longer term interest rates starting to rise. This point we were at in February was the lowest yields in a thousand years. And we know that going forward, we've seen rates fall since 1981. And the Fed now is trying very, very hard to try and reflate the economy with this extraordinary monetary stimulus. The fiscal stimulus should help as well. We know that what happens when rates start to rise is that dividend growth becomes more attractive. So I just wanted to quickly make the case for dividend growth. 
Dividend growth does well through all markets in general. Since 1986, dividend growers have returned about 10.5% a year versus high dividend payers versus the TSX and certainly dividend cutters, not something we want to compare to. So it's been a good cohort of companies to focus in. And of course, our income strategy is very focused in dividend growth. We know if you put a mountain chart together, you take, take um, $1,000 in 1986, you know, the dividend growth cohort has grown, grew to a peak before this pullback at 96, about $36,000 versus just high dividend pairs at 16,000, about double the return over the period. And of course, TSX a long way behind. So it's a good cohort to focus in. Most importantly, because when we look at volatility annually, dividend growers tend to have a much lower volatility than some of these other cohorts we just talked about. So in the early 1950s, when rates started to rise from the last generational bottom, the stock market went up 15% a year for the next uh, 16 years and dividend growth well exceeded the index's returns. So we think that the, cat, the, the going forward strategy for most private investors should be focused on sort of that dividend growth cohort. There will be things to do in the commodities, will be things to do in precious metals with these uh, uh, very, uh, uh, very low rates. But the reality is we think dividend growth is going to be a strategy we're going to continue to focus in. If things do get difficult because the short-term data is extended and we start to see things roll over at all, we will get defended. Uh, we do have a history of playing pretty good defense in the extended declines we've seen in the market. But at this point, we really believe we continue to be in a structural bull market. The fact that breadth has improved as much as it has is very, very uh, bullish. And despite the fact that we could pull back at any point in time, we have the portfolios positioned longer term to take advantage of these structural themes that we think continue to, will continue to outperform the market. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please forward them to us. For some reason, they're not showing up on my screen today uh, as I don't have my, my co-host on the line. Uh, but thanks very much for tuning in and we look forward to talking to you again next week.